and live in a few seconds when I go live. <laughs> None other than Alderman Van Johnson. Woo! This Yay! is what we need a little applause for you. Yeah, right. Insert applause here. <laughs> Ladies, Welcome, thank man. you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Absolutely, it's an honor. Rookie Mo. He knows both of us on uh, two different levels, so tonight he gets to know us as radio hosts. That's right. <laughs> so tell us, man, uh, are you a native of Savannah? No, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Born and raised, I came to Savannah when I was. 16 years old to attend Savannah State College. Woo! So I am a Savannah State Tiger. Woo! I appreciated the nurturing love that Savannah State gave me. Went back to New York um, to uh, pursue some other types of uh, endeavors after graduate, uh, undergraduate school. Couldn't find anything, came back to Savannah, went to graduate school, went back to New York, and then came back, and I've been here ever since. So, what got you started in politics, of all things? Radio, actually. Really? Yeah, uh, I was hosting on uh, WSOK Radio, a show called Open Line Outreach, I did it for five years. Um, we, it was every Wednesday, and we had the opportunity to really talk about things that are happening in the community. Um, whatever Kennedy Trail office, all the way up to, at the time, uh, Governor Roy Walmart. They would always come through town and come on our show um, to talk about what was happening in the community. So it gave me a real pulse of what was going on. I also wrote for some years uh, for the Savannah Tribune, uh, and then being involved in various community um, things happening. And um, eventually, it just came to fruition that um, it was time sometimes to not complain about things and have to actually put my hat in the ring, so to speak, and, and get into the game. So tell us what has changed from the time you got in office years ago to now. Well, it's been 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm starting my 16th year in elected office. Um, and Savannah has changed, um, and I'm, in, in some ways, good, uh, in some ways, no change at all, and in some ways, worse. Um, Savannah is, first of all, it's a beautiful city, it's a wonderful city, it's an average city. Uh, people, and I, and, and, and I fell in love with Savannah because of the people. I, I mean, obviously, I could have moved anywhere I wanted to move. I, I had, you know, no real um, uh, things holding me here. I had some family here, but in terms of, you know, I mean, I could have ran to Atlanta where I was going mm -hmm. to DC or to Charlotte at the time, which was just kind of up and coming. Um, but there was something about Savannah that stuck me here. And really, I think it was just the, the potential of Savannah. Um, that Savannah just had so much potential, so many good things happening, so many good people to help make it happen. And, um, and so to, to answer your question more directly, um, I, I'm concerned that we might become a little too over-commercialized. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now you see gentrification happening where it is expensive, Very. if not impossible, to live in downtown Savannah. Very. And now, now that part is starting to sprawl out. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one of the things that is not so good. Um, we have a growing homeless population. Mm -hmm. um, that's some for some reasons that are beyond our own. Um, doing, but yet, you know, they're here, so they're ours. Um, uh, we have a poverty rate that has remained largely unchanged um, over the last 30 years. Again, those are factors beyond, not totally beyond, but uh, but mostly beyond the city's um, ability to, to correct them, but I think the city pays, plays a major role. Um, the things I think have gotten better, I think we've done um, some good things in, in some of our neighborhoods, and particularly in terms of affordable housing. Um, I think that we have had some really good programs to, to come through the city. I think uh, we've been able to bolster our police department and our fire department. Um, our fire department, which is what's called the uh, ISO Class 1, which is the highest um, rating a fire department can receive in the country. Uh, so for us, that's, that's a, I think, a big deal. Um, and, and so I think that in, in those ways, we've been able to do well. Um, 
And then something, like I said, just if they say. Mm -hmm. So what district do you represent and what does that region entail? Well, I represent District 1. Mm -hmm. um, I call it the Phenomenal First District. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's, it's, it's um, currently the best district in the world. <laughs> um, it is probably one of the most diverse districts in the world. Now, when I first started, I represented downtown Savannah. Mm -hmm. um, as of this term, I don't represent downtown Savannah anymore. But I've, rep I've represented downtown, um, the Victorian area, um, Cobble Village, Cloverdale, Tremont Park, Collar Brownsville, Oneichiton, West Savannah, Hudson Hill, Woodville, Hutchison Island, um, and then the airport, and it was called Golly Station in the Hollands. All so of that is in the first district. Area. And so we have very rich um, people, and then I have three housing um, developments, uh, public housing developments in my district as well. So we run the gamut of having a million dollar homes and then having homes that are uh, heavily subsidized. So we have a uh, both. How do you uh, explain gentrification to your constituents? Because it it seems like your area is so diverse, but it could spill over. You know, West Savannah is not that far from downtown. <laughs> uh, it's, it's literally just a vibe, though. Right. <laughs> um, gentrification uh, defined in the, probably the most simplest terms is where sprawl uh, occurs where Ultimately, the individuals who live in that area cannot afford to live there anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's by, uh, it's, it's sometimes a natural process by de development. Um, property gets blighted, the community area gets blighted, the neighborhood gets blighted, there's a lot of um, vacant places. Mm -hmm. And then you know, developers come in because the land is cheap, they, they fix it up, and they have a higher end tenant, a higher end business that comes there. And, and so what's up happening is that the individuals who used to live there can't live there anymore. Mm -hmm. And then you can almost see it happening and where it happens because you can see of really where um, the neighborhood ends and where the gentrification begins. Mm -hmm. And so if you notice now, um, downtown has sprawled out. Um, now in, in the 30s and the 40s, the Stalin District is, is an example right. of how that has occurred as well. Um, you know. It, it's a it's an occurrence that sometimes need to occur because um, you know neighborhoods die and people say the well, city just buy it all up on well, the city is not necessarily in the landlord business mm -hmm. um, so it's really a function of the market but the problem is is that then the areas where people used to live um, they cannot afford to live anymore and I um, when I used to come when I first when I was in college um, Jefferson Street I know from the Civic Center to Gwinnett Street is where the prostitutes used to walk at night. <laughs> yep. Now, now, don't ask me how I know that. Yep. And I don't, you know, lie. <laughs> but this, but, but that's where they were. I mean, right. these were row houses that were very dilapidated, um, and the prostitutes used to walk up and down there at night. Well, uh, now they have taken those same homes. Um, Mom and them have died or moved on, and, and son and daughter, grandson, granddaughter. Uh, many of them have sold those houses at very, very low rates. Mm -hmm. And now you have these houses here that have garages mm -hmm. and they have balconies. And now the folks who used to live that. there cannot afford to live there anymore. I see that all they just time. can't. And so, <laughs> you know, and the bad part is, again, it's function of the market. So, you know, I inherit grandmama's home. Uh, grandmama had the house paid for. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I probably could have fixed it up myself. But, but somebody comes there. and they mm -hmm. offer me. You know, twenty thousand yep. dollars in cash. I'm like twenty thousand dollars in cash, really? Yeah. And so right I, now. I take that? it, right. <laughs> and the first thing I do is go buy me a car. Mm -hmm. The problem is, I got me a nice car with spinners. Now I got to go pay rent somewhere yep. else <laughs> because I, the, because the, the value was in the homestead, yep. having a place to live. Yep. And we just don't recognize that value. Ooh, Lord. Or people moving out of the city core, moving. You know, the Poolers and the Bloomingdales and the Rankins and Effingham's, all that, you know, and and not necessarily having the amenities that a city government provides. Mm -hmm. They're paying for it out of cart. So yep. their taxes are lower, but, but in the end, by the time you pay yeah. for the sides, you know, you've already paid what you were paid anyway. Mm -hmm. And then they have to come here anyway for their leisure and their right. activities. And going, stemming from something that happened at work, but it's public uh, information. Y'all mentioned that during the budget retreat. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. about how you know people say that our taxes are higher than other municipalities around us but they don't realize that well, I, they're paying for all those separate services that they pay for I, I raised that issue I, I raised that issue that's how yeah. I remember it um, because we say that you know we're so much higher than everybody else well you know think about it as a buffet we are all inclusive mm -hmm. you'll drink your piece of bread and your food is there and you can come as many times yep. as you want to yep. you know when they do it they pay they pay a basic thing for maybe a piece of meat and then mm -hmm. they pay for their size they pay for their drink and then, you know yeah. by the time you pay for all that stuff you're paying what you would have paid at the buffet anyway exactly. and so for for us you know we have again a state-of-the-art police department state-of-the-art fire department mm -hmm. um and you you know you have trash collection we own our water so we we process water we have some of the best water in the nation um so by the time they pay for all of that stuff, pay for their trash, pay for their fire, pay for all those things. They might as well have paid for them, for, the, for the taxes themselves. I agree. I'm, I'm glad you said that because it, it, needs, it needs to be known exactly what people spend their money on. You know, and that's, that's been a big issue recently. Admittedly, we have not done a good job of telling people. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, if you did not tell your story, you know, then other people tell it for you. Some people, oh, it's so high to live here, so high to live here. Oh, no, you go down to Florida to see how high it lives. Yeah. But the difference is in Florida is everything is a la carte. Mm -hmm. So they just they just give you fees to death. Mm -hmm. Ooh, yeah. Lord. No, no, thank you. <laughs> no, they just give you fees. No, thank you. So the um, development that SCAD is getting ready to start, that's also in your district, correct? Which well, one? Montgomery Cross. Oh, no. Crossroads on Montgomery, um, where Mickey's is. No, it's that's not. not no, is that the fifth district? It's the fifth. Okay. So where does your line end? Is it Gwinnett? Um, it well, for all practical purposes, in downtown court it's in Victory Drive mm -hmm. and MLK. Okay. Um, on the north side. Okay. So Shabazz's restaurant is in your district, but yes. on the other side of the street, Correct. that's Fifth District. Correct. Okay, now I got the lines Correct. together now. <laughs> um, now you know, and again, that's another. I mean, SCAD has been an absolute blessing for Savannah. So SCAD um, came here at a time where Savannah was in light and disrepair, and they started their machine. Now SCAD is a multi-million dollar corporation, mm -hmm. um, and they build things, and when they build them. Um, they build them as amenities and facilities for their students. Um, the problem is, is that these, these facilities and amenities are in neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So they build them up so we're looking at a wall, mm -hmm. but yet their students have the benefit of what's inside of them. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, my latest push with, with SCAD is um, that if you're going to do it, you need to donate some public space, public amenities, something that the community benefits from you being there. Because when your students are not there, our residents are looking at walls. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you could do those in terms of public gardens, public space, public parks, public art. Um, I think it's a variety of ways of, of being able to do it. I don't want to, to kill the, um, the golden goose, so to speak, <laughs> or the goose that made the golden egg. But I mean, I think that, you know, on the other end of it, um, there are just get so many buildings that, that are here from SCAD. And the moment they buy them, um, they come off of the property tax rolls. Yeah. So that means now that you know there are buildings here, and I've heard there were um, thousands of them, literally, that don't pay any property tax. Yeah. Um, and so they're not paying their part of the load for police or for fire and all types of things. So right. um, we have to come up with a way of either, I've suggested payment of lieu of taxes or some type of means of being able to say, hey, help us to cover that. Because if something happens, if, if something burns down, our fire department has to cover. Yep. Or our police department has to cover. So, Let's see ways we can we can help to not make it a burden on them, but also be able to our budget. I like the community partnerships idea because there are so many um, spaces owned by not only SCAD but other um, nonprofit institutions that are privatized for their members or their right. students, whatnot but yet they take up so much space in the communities. So let's bridge that gap. You know, and maybe then you can encourage those those community partners to become members in your right. nonprofit. Everybody works together. That's right. Period. That's right. And we have to we have to start those conversations before it happens. 
It's yeah. much harder once the once it's happened for the community. You know, now let's talk about it. How how we do it now? No, we had a conversation before. And when people come in, into your city knowing that's what you're gonna do, then they know the deal is before they ever sit down at the table for you. Right. Are you working on any other partnerships? Um, there, there's a bunch of them, um, a variety of things. One that I was really uh, very proud of um, when it affected July 1st, it was the reduction of, of criminal penalties for marijuana use. Yes. Um, very proud of that because at first I did not think that it was going to pass. Um, marijuana is a very big issue, very hot issue. Um, and marijuana in Georgia is still illegal, mm -hmm. but everybody smoke weed. Not everybody, mm -hmm. a, whole lot of, a whole lot of people smoke right. weed. I do not smoke weed. I will say that. You make that very right. I do not disclaim. I do not smoke weed. But, but for for our community, when we looked at arrest, we saw that in 2016, 2017, in both years, we had over 600 people that were arrested for a simple possession of marijuana, which is less than 28 grams. That's the equivalent of one joint, okay? So a person is arrested, they, an officer now has to uh, complete what's called an A and B arrest and booking form. They take them into custody, they have to transport them to the jail, the jail takes them in, they have to take their pictures and finger fingerprints. Now they receive what's called a DIN, which is a defendant identification number. They are now in the criminal justice system. Even if they're released, the fact is they're now in here. Now, it may not be an issue that day. You know, they pay a fine or something going about their lives. But the day that they decide they want a professional job, um, and someone does a background check and they see marijuana charge, first thing you think, drug deal. Mm -hmm. Or if you try to get some places, you if you have a drug offense and you try to get an apartment, you can't get it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I've heard people in the military that you can't get into it. Or um, some colleges, if you try to get into higher education, sometimes some charges you see the college. Yes. Right, right. So um, for me, it was a significant issue because that means that if our young people don't have an opportunity uh, to help make their dreams come true, then they have to find other ways to make life happen. Mm -hmm. And so we, we implemented this where we would allow the officer the discretion that they did not have to arrest, right? Before then, Georgia law was basically that the officer had no choice really but to arrest. Mm -hmm. Now the officer can also issue a citation um, with, with fines um, that are escalating and, and, and um, you know, they can hopefully avoid a, pay a penalty but yet avoid the arrest, uh, which hopefully keeps them out of the system, which hopefully um, you know, cr creates a, a better outcome for them. And uh, for what I understood, I think we've arrested probably half of what we've arrested in 2016 and 15. 15 and 16, 16 and 17, which means for us, you know, that's maybe half of uh, young people and older people mm -hmm. that maybe have have a second chance. Hopefully, they'll learn from it. That's amazing. Or a gun problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, and guns are readily available uh, in our state. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer of the Second Amendment. However, we know that the guns in the wrong hands means trouble, mm -hmm. and the guns seem to be available. Uh, all of them over the place. When we have, we see that burglaries are up, we know that guns are in the streets because people break into houses, they're not stealing jewelry, looking for guns. Um, and we still do not secure our guns like we should. You know, we leave them in the glove compartment, like people don't know that there's guns in the gun glove compartment. Um, we leave them unsecured. Um, the other part is, is, is a people problem. People use guns. Um, we have to teach our young people and some of our not so young people that um, there are better ways of addressing conflict than to do it with a gun. When I was growing up in Brooklyn, and although Brooklyn was rough, you know, for those that I grew up with, those we had beef with, I mean, we fought. And when it was over, it was over. The next day we were cool. You know, the problem with, with guns is that when you shoot someone, a gun, often it is permanent, um, and no one's coming back from the grave. Um, beyond that, I think that it is, it's a, a, a need for us to start treating, and we have not done this, of treating our males, particularly our young black males, because that's who's involved with most of the um, non-random violence, um, is that 
that they are victims of post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. These are young men who for the majority of their lives have lived in urban areas. Many of them have seen dead bodies. They've seen guns. They've seen violence. They've heard words. They've heard violence. I mean, as I was growing up, my parents didn't give me, I couldn't listen to some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if it was a curse word, you couldn't listen to mm -hmm. it. But they, they see these things. And they feel pain when their boy gets killed or somebody they know gets killed and they get hurt. And then they internalize that pain. They don't know, you know, they're hurting. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen guys do it and I've gone up to them. I mean, because you see them, they're walking, they're shaking their heads and they're internalizing this pain, mm -hmm. which turns to anger. Right. And they believe that if I hurt you, then that will help my pain, mm -hmm. and it doesn't. And it's a it's a repeating process that happens all over again. I would really like to see sometimes when people are involved or are around that we treat them as the victims as they are. Right. Um, to be able to start saying, let's talk about what you saw, what you experienced, how you felt, because we literally have thousands of ticking time bombs um, that are just walking around angry and they're mad. I mean, and for a variety of reasons, um, and I think you know you have to deal with with that with their reality. Um, you know, people want and have the need to defend themselves, and defending themselves need to pull out a gun, and that's what they're going to do. So we, as a community, have to make them feel safe, um, and then we have to make sure that individuals who have committed these crimes are off the streets. Um, and I, people who say this a lot of people, get mad what I say it, but the Criminals of yesterday, um, the criminals of the criminals today were in diapers yesterday, and the, and the, and the criminals tomorrow are in diapers today. And um, you know, we have sometimes and I, and I have love mothers, but you know, mothers, you know, my boy, you know, and they they're protecting him, mm -hmm. they're shielding him. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you bring in the illegal TV and say the Lord bless you, Lord ain't bless you with that. They <laughs> stole. <laughs> Sure will say that. Well, mama, sure you know, I got five hundred dollars, you know, and he blessed me with that. No, he didn't mm -hmm. bless you with that because <clears throat> you know he has no job. Right. And if you're not saying that this is bad behavior, mm -hmm. then to me, you're just as guilty as he is. Absolutely. And then when something happens, then all of a sudden, oh, but he was a good boy. I'm sure he was a good boy, mm -hmm. but he was also a criminal. And so sometimes. As I told a parent once, and she was really mad with me when I said it, but then later on um, told me that she thought I was right, that your child being locked up would have saved his life. Yeah. You would much rather go see your child in jail where he might get out one day mm -hmm. than to go see your child in a cemetery where he won't ever get out. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we think that we're loving them by, by harboring them, but really we're weakening them. And, and we and we have to do better. Um, and then finally, for our community, um, you know, if people see something, they have to say something. Mm -hmm. um, yes, because again, please. When you, when you see stuff, man, I ain't see nothing. I'm telling I, you, I, that's Paul. That's between y'all. I mean, <laughs> like, you know, and it's like you you have to have a better mentality um, that you know what affects you today will affect me tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so you know, don't do nothing illegal around me. I'm gonna tell. Straight up. Yeah, I mean, straight up. Brooke does something illegal. I'm telling you, I'm calling Solid Witness. Why? 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 I'm gonna call Crime Stopper. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get that reward. It's funny you say that because they're now offering a hundred thousand dollar reward for the guy who shot up. It's a white male who shot up the car with this where the seven year old girl died. Yeah. And I was like. Will he please come to Savannah so I can spot him? <laughs> yeah. I will tell him it's yeah. so I mean, Well, because in some crimes, I mean, particularly with innocent victims, and in this case, um, you know, there's some indications of being a hate crime. They're so egregious. I mean, mm -hmm. here was this mother and her daughters, and they were just going about their business to their business, and yet, you know, this happened. And I mean, you know, people really get upset about those things, and unfortunately, money is an incentive sometimes for people to, to start saying it. But in most cases, sadly, it's still not enough, you know, for people to be willing to speak Well, out. what I found is, is that and sometimes time has to go past by. 
but you know when when things start happening to you, people want to they want to talk then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and so sometimes the right issue has to happen. You know, I'm going to get locked up all of a sudden. I'm going to talk. Mm -hmm. And so you know, sometimes those things have to happen. But if you know this community, information flows to this community like high cakes. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be able to be more proactive on that. And that you know, if, if something happens, let people know. If you if you do this on my block, oh, I'm telling. I'm telling the car, the make of the car, who you are with. And I know when I was growing up, my parents said, if you do it, we're taking you to jail ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I believe that. That accountability is missing. Yeah, and that just that neighborhood closeness right there. Because mm -hmm. I do remember when I first moved to Savannah, I lived out, and we lived out at Georgetown. So if, you, if there's an unrecognized car in that neighborhood, they're going to walk up to your car, they're going to knock on your window, they're going to want to know what you're doing there, mm -hmm. who you're with, and, you know, if you don't have any answers, you're going to be asked to leave. So Or the police are going to be called. And, you exactly. Know, the police, and I mean, even on, on, on the block I live now, I have uh, some, I have older neighbors, and one thing about it, somebody roll up too dark or too late, I see mm -hmm. the blinds <laughs> open up, I see the eyes yeah. looking. I mean, that's that's what we need. Yeah, I mean, yeah we absolutely. We need more people to be able to do that, because if, you know, now in, across our city, we have people where they walk down the streets, and they, um, they just hit the... Um, the driver's side doors mm -hmm. because people in Savannah still leave their car doors open. Yep. And sometimes they can break in your car without ever even um, breaking a window or anything. Mm -hmm. And so if it doesn't look right, it's probably not right. right. Let the police decide one way or another if it's not right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you come my neighborhood with that. I mean, we call them. We yeah. are calling. That means sure we got three calls already, Mr. Johnson. So, okay, make it short. Straight <laughs> up. All right, we're going to pause right there uh, to pay some bills. The Georgia Historical Society will present Super Museum Sunday on February 10th yes. when dozens of participating Georgia historic sites, homes, and museums will be free and open to the public from 12 to 4 p.m. Yes. For more information, visit georgiahistory.com. And we're back live with Alderman Van Johnson, who's also schooling us <laughs> right. in radio. Because <laughs> we're still rookies at this thing. Well, I mean, when you know better, you do better. So, so. we're right. <laughs> Somebody right. had to tell me. <laughs> right. <laughs> we love it. Absolutely. <laughs> we love it. So, switching gears. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you've done some uh, great things for this community. Absolutely. What are... Um, what are some of your future plans? Um, well, um, I have some decisions to make. Um, this is an election year for mm -hmm. me, uh, for the Savannah, city of Savannah. Every four years, we have to go before people and have to, um, you know, prove our work in this our current seat or for another seat. And so I'm, I'm making some decisions in terms of um, if I could be of greater value, mm -hmm. um, if I could be in our city, um, if I could provide leadership on another level, and so that's where um, yeah, I've been talking. Um, I think our reality is that um, our city can only do as well as the individuals that lead it, that serve it, um, and they have to have people with a servant's heart and a servant's mentality um, to look at all Savannah. All Savannah. Um, Savannah still has a race issue. Very um, absolutely. And we don't get better by ignoring it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a beneficiary of the civil rights movement. I have never marched, you know, in the civil rights movement. You know, matter of fact, Dr. King died the year I was born. Um, it's all right, I don't know what it's like to have a dog chasing after me or those types of things. I do know uh, of discrimination, you know, in the paper form. Um, and so I think for us as a community, we have to be able to talk about those things, put them out there, let people vent their, their feelings. Um, I have been blessed to come into contact with people of all races of goodwill, people who have helped me in, in, in monumental ways, who have been mentors to me. And I appreciate that. I mean, I think that we have to realize that, you know, there's no black Savannah, there's no white Savannah. I mean, we're Savannah. Mm -hmm. Um, and we need our young people to grow up believing it in that way and our older folks to be able to recognize that they hopefully we're not the same way that we were um, and if we are we need to identify those areas and address them 
um, because we, we need Savannah to be a place of not only history, but also um, uh, on the cutting edge of innovation um, and a variety of things. We want Savannah to be the place that, that millennials are going to come here and hang out. I mean, they go to Atlanta, I mean, I'm not really impressed with Atlanta. <laughs> I don't think. Uh, I mean, I'm not. You know, we, we go to the A, and right. the funny part, and the funny part about it is that people, oh, we the A, and we the A, and the people yeah. I know in the A, and the young people I know in the A, they live in four and five deep in a house. They work in three or four jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, to keep up. Ro yep. rolling That's up, what it is. rolling up in the club every week. I mean, come on, is right. that the life? But here, you, know, you can live in Savannah and own a home, mm -hmm. a nice home. And that you could fix it up and that you could grow into and those things. I mean, you can go visit to Atlanta and turn up like I do when you want to turn up. <laughs> and, and, and then come on back to some reality and a whole lot less traffic. Right. Um, oh, yes. Right. But, you know, but how do, how do we create those types of opportunities for, for people to grow and then start their own businesses? I mean, here you are. I mean, if you two ladies, I mean, who says that you would have a radio show mm -hmm. in Atlanta? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just too many people there. Right, yeah. And so here you're able to, to do these things, and I want Savannah to be the type of place where people can come here and, and live out their dreams. And, and so, you know, we want to be the historic place where people come and walk down and say, oh, and we want to be the place where people come and say, oh, ghosts, and we want people to come here and get drunk for St. Patrick's Day. Right. We want them to come be, but we also want them to recognize the potential of Savannah. What do you envision the uh, young, especially the young black professionals of Savannah, contributing to the community? Oh my gosh, energy, um, ideas. The, the issue is, is that I'm, I'm 50 years old. <laughs> I just said that now. Yeah, you're 50 years young. Y'all <laughs> just, just blew me. I mean, <laughs> but for 15 years, I've been the youngest member of the Savannah City Council, and I am now. Ooh. So the individual, not that there's anything necessarily wrong with it, but the individuals making decisions for the future of our city are 60 and 70 years old. What does that say for us in terms of innovation? How, what does it say for individuals that, that want to be able to move here and make Savannah hot? I mean, they don't know how to make it hot. I barely know how to make it hot. <laughs> you know, no, but I, I, I mean, but you understand what I'm saying? I mean, we have now young people, young professionals, both black and white, I mean, who've been all over the world. They've seen things, and, and they want to come back here with their ideas. And the yeah. worst thing is come here with these really great ideas and people are like, nah. Yep. Nah, that ain't gonna work. It's not gonna work here. No, yeah. I mean, you know, let's create opportunities for for that to work because we want it to be so hot. I remember, um, I'm, I'm it's one of the founders of Orange Crush. Don't hold it against me. <laughs> but we we did it because at the time in Savannah State, we were going to Freaknik, we were going to um, Daytona Beach, and we had a beach. And we're like, yo, this is an opportunity for us, you know, to invite people to our city, you know, and be a host in our thing. Now, you know, first several worked out really well, then there were problems when um, non-college kids got involved. But right. the whole point of it was, was that we were proud to invite people to our city. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to be where, you know, young professionals have the, the, the things that they have. I mean, you know, in terms of minority participation things, I mean, you know, we're a majority, minority city, not one black hotel, owned hotel. All right, so, you know, and, and so we have the ability, financial ability, to make sure that um, businesses do well here mm -hmm. if we just um, support those that we have. Mm -hmm. But we don't, we, we don't generally do it, but I mean, you know, but yet you have a, a younger set that they understand the importance of recycling money and, and spending it locally. And so, I mean, I think, you know, utilizing that energy, utilizing that excitement, their eternal optimism, um, I think, you know, you know, makes it work. I want them ultimately to be able to run for office and serve in office. We just had a 29-year-old. Is the youngest member ever um, yeah. elected to Congress? Alex. Twenty-nine years old, right? From, yeah, from, from New York. New York. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so think about that. So twenty-nine years old, and, and they're making all the rage of this, and that over two hundred somebody history of the United States mm -hmm. is the youngest person. And so you know you're not going to get um, younger views unless you have younger people at the table. And so um, as I've always uh, advocated for that. And, and to continue, and I, I wanted to be the place. But you know what? You know this is 
you know, hey, your show is where to go to. People are listening. This is what we need to do. These are the issues. Right. Um, you know, they're voters, and, and they they have some real views about what they want their Savannah to look like. And I, you know, and I want to hear that. Are you still heavily involved with Savannah Youth Council? I founded the Savannah Youth Council in 2004, mm -hmm. um, and, and the Chatham County Youth Commission. Um, I've been working with that for 23 years. Our oldest members are now in their 40s. Um, and we have 600 graduates since 1991. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so the, again, I guess you know, it helps keep me young. Um, <laughs> and keep me kind of knowing what's kind of on the post because every generation gets different. Um, and I learn new words by the time I learn a word and it's get old. it down, it's gone. Yeah. You know, and I think I can hang and I can't hang. Don't worry, because uh, we were out of town recently, and my oh, daughter, <laughs> my daughter started dancing. She was like, "Yeah, what did she say? Like, hey, I, I, I want to go buggy." Oh or my gosh! She, like so they had. We went to the Memphis Children's Museum, <laughs> and they had. It's amazing because the way they have it set up yes. is like occupational. Right. So they have all these different occupations that the um, kids can explore. And we can do that here. It. Oh, it made us get trash. Did y'all go by the Lorraine Motel? Uh, of course we did. We did. That yes, was our number one. Yes, it was great. <laughs> right. That was exciting for us. Right? Look, that Especially was our Especially now day. How, they, how, they, how they've connected it across the street to mm -hmm. the uh, book depository mm -hmm. and yep. all of that. So, yeah. But, yeah. So, in other words, you can't dance. No, no, no. So, she's in there, right? And there's like a little dance party area. So Mo was like, yeah, what were you guys doing? She's like, we were boogieing. Yeah, my, my five-year-old. So, we were boogieing. Yes, that's exactly what she said. So don't feel bad because that's, the terms, that's, they that's come even, back around. That's even older than me. <laughs> they come back around. <laughs> <laughs> but doubling back, Van, speaking of that children's museum, because for one, you know, I'm from D.C., so our children's museum up there is spectacular, but it still had nothing on <laughs> Memphis. Like That's seriously, nice. I love this setup. But Savannah Children's Museum realistically is trash. It's garbage. It's a playground. It's purely out. It's purely outdoor. It's great if you're two and under. Anything above that, if your child is, you know, you know, pretty advancing as they should, they're not going to find anything in there. Well, but those are opportunities to be able to say to, to those types of businesses and things and say, hey, you know, these are opportunities that we can do better. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, again, I, I travel around the country and, you know, it's a great opportunity to go and, and, and look and see what other people are doing. How, what are they doing? How are they being successful with what they're doing? Um, and it's not beyond me to steal people's ideas. <laughs> I, mean, you, I mean, that's how you get better. And that's how you grow. So yeah. no need to reinvent the wheel. No, <laughs> no but, but oftentimes we try to. And so, you know, I think, you know, you look at and if you set the atmosphere for creativity and innovation, it occurs. That's, that's what Silicon Valley uh, became about, you know, just people being around saying, you know what, why not? And so you want people to be able to do that. You want, it, particularly if you release the city government, if there are better ways of doing things, you want to have it where people are able um, to flow those ideas. Um, to to your city government. And I said some things, you know, most things are funding issues, um, but yeah, some things are sometimes just issues of support. Um, many things are issues of grants. Um, so let's find ways of, you know, getting a grant to do this or getting a grant to be able to do that. Again, I, I don't think that we've really embraced the our potential, mm -hmm. and that's unfortunate. I can definitely say that. What do you think would be, other than the ports, because people tend to focus on the ports here, which they, it is, you know, a major industry, but what other industry do you think has the potential to be as large as the ports, bringing in so much to our economy? Um, well, I mean, our, our, our tourism is a huge contributor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Savannah is a tourist city, so we have a large, well, we also have military which is a large contributor as well. So people don't really think about that. Um, government is, is large here. Um, but we have, we found ourselves really in a situation where we can really become a technological platform, um, where we can become a city of wireless, a Wi-Fi city, where you know we know people use Wi-Fi. Why can't it be? You know, it's just a matter of fact mm -hmm. that we have a city that you know you can kind of get onto the net. Mm -hmm. We know where you're able, particularly low-income areas, 
across the digital divide where people have access to the internet, you know, we know that they have the ability to now do things. They're now in touch with the world. Right. And, and, and unfortunately, in our city still right now, well, we don't have some of those things. Um, so I think we, we really work on, on technology as a way of being able to do it. And then also to really work on our ability for vocational training. Um, you know, I have a master's degree. Um, I work very hard for. I consider myself a pretty smart guy. But when my air conditioner goes out in, my <laughs> right. in Savannah in July with a hundred and fifty degree temperature, right. I'm gonna pay the air conditioner man whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. Whatever and I mean he might have a high school diploma, boy. Right. At you that point he he's the most important man in my life. <laughs> Look, I will pay you what you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if my car breaks down, I have a master's degree, but mm -hmm. if my car breaks down, I'm going to pay a man what he wants. Right. So, I mean, you know, and now people who can build things and people who can fix things. I mean, we have houses here that sometimes need to be re um, redeveloped or houses that can be improved. I mean, people can make great money with their hands. I've learned that college is not for everybody. Mm -hmm. And when we get out of that mindset and start preparing people to be able to make money, right? How do you be able? To, how you're able to do that? I think now you create opportunities for people to to, to build wealth. And once they're able to to, to do that, um, again, I think it grows all of our sectors, and I think all of our sectors need to equally grow. Mm -hmm. um, because again, when people come here, people need various things. Um, some moves here from DC, so to speak. They're going to need a house to stay in. They're going to need a yard man. They're going to need a plumber. They're going to need an electrician. They're going to need this. They're going to need that. Um, you know, so why not create those opportunities um, for people to do that? I mean, um, music is still very big across our country. We have a lot of guys, young guys, young ladies, who for them is still their dream. Mm -hmm. And so let's find a way to help them to cultivate their dreams. Right. Um, I think of um, Flage. Um, yes, you know, yes. And, and I knew her dad. Um, and, you know, so he never got to where he really was going. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact of the matter was, was that, you know, again, there are talented young people out here that have a story to tell and that have talent that want to be able to show. That's why we're building this cultural arts center. Um, because again, you know, we need places locally for our young people to show their talents. Mm -hmm. And why shouldn't it be downtown? And why shouldn't it be state of the art? Because I think they deserve it. You know, if they if they're not shaking, the, the, if they're not dancing culturally with us. They're shaking in my house for BET. So I mean, I rather them do, <laughs> do it, learn, learn the technique instead of the pole. You know what I'm saying? Right. You know, learn first position, second position, third position, fourth position. Learn please and relevates and all those things mm -hmm. that are, I mean, you know, if you're going to do it, but, but right. know the technique behind it. Right. You know, because again, I think that we are children of rhythm and children of, of creativity and we need to find ways Definitely. to be able to do that. Find things that young people are interested in and you don't have to be in the mm -hmm. See, that's it. You got to keep them engaged because when you talk about public safety and crime reduction, that's just a, a symptom of the root cause. Yep. The root cause is they're not engaged, period, or they don't feel supported, period. They have so many different interests. You just sit down and talk to one of these kids. They'll tell you everything that some things you may not want to hear. Oh, you most know. times, most things you don't want to hear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we learned that on vacation, too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you find out you find out a whole bunch of things, and, and so you know we we have a responsibility to again reach people where they are, um, and, and that's everybody. Um, you know, we we also had our, our city of a lot of seniors. Um, you know they're not dead yet, um, and you know I think they have talents they can contribute. Many are educators. I mean, yeah, this is an opportunity. We need you back in the game to help us. To the to the some of these kids, yes. But I think for, for many of them, they just never been asked. Mm -hmm. They never been asked, mm -hmm. or find ways to make it worth their while to do it. Mm -hmm. I love that we need to get back to the community. That's right. Get everybody involved. Everybody. I love that, and then all the young people just kind of fund it all. <laughs> well, hey, because again, but in the end, in the final analysis, you know, this city is for them. Um, it's for them, it's about them, and we want them to be able to, to, to engage in, in, in that way where, you know, they feel some ownership um, over their city. So we're running out of time. Oh, really? Already? <laughs> yeah, already. I'm telling you that hour passes by so quickly. Well, but well, How long is the show? 
It's an, an hour. hour. Oh. Like we wrote in the email. Oh, the shade. Shade. <laughs> no, but um, before we go, and we're going to let you say some final words as well. Um, I just want to thank you for everything you do you for I the city. Mm-hmm. I know the first time I actually took an interest in Mr. Johnson was during Hurricane Matthew, I believe. Yes. That was the first one. Mm-hmm. Um, because... We actually decided to wait that one out. We didn't evacuate because it wasn't that serious. But it turned out to be pretty serious. Very serious. Yeah. But what I can say, Van was one of the main people. He was like the only person actually I think actively. The only council member that stayed. <laughs> actively informing people what was open, what roads were blocked off, what time to be in the house. You know, just being out there, being connected with your people. And that's important. That's an important quality of a leader. Mm. Um, I appreciate that. I mean, <laughs> I didn't actually start off doing that. I mean, it just kind of happened like that. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> we found that people were looking at Florida and they were looking at Charleston, but they weren't paying attention to Savannah. Mm. And so people needed a way. So it was an opportunity to use social media um, to, to do that. Oh, by the way, I'm Alderman Johnson um, on Facebook. Can y'all like my page? Alderman Please Johnson, tell everyone Facebook, where to find you, all your pages. And, um, all Instagram, is Alderman <laughs> Johnson, and, and Twitter, is Alderman Johnson. So, oh, you um, on Twitter too? I'm going to have to follow you on Twitter. Yeah, that's not no, your IG is Van that's Johnson. Not no, my Alderman, I, I have two of them. Okay, okay, my bad. So, so many. Many. <laughs> uh, But, um, so it was just an opportunity for me to really be able to help engage and let people know what was going on in their city. Blessed for the opportunity. Imani Solomon, good to see you. And um, Aletha. That's my um, sister, Aletha. Oh, hey, Aletha. She's, at, she's in Bronx. Oh, really? Yep. Cool. Brooklyn Near House. University Avenue. Um, Carlton Charlton says it got dark because of the shade. It sure did. <laughs> I mean, Shots out to Charlton. I mean, Char- Charlton, man. I, I mean, it, it got, I mean. Really? We were pitch black. Really? But, um, you know, it wasn't that so, dark. But, but you know, we had to evacuate two years in a row. Thank God last year we did not, but in 16, yes. 17 we did. Um, and, and the Lord spared us. But uh, in the meantime, there was some heroin at times for, for people. And, you know, next thing I know, people were asking what the weather forecast was. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, we're a public servant, you, you serve the public. So that's just what I did. And, um, you know, Thank Next you time something comes, Alderman Johnson on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. <laughs> Ask Snapchat, you know how to use it yet. Oh, okay. I was about to say, let me come find you on just Snapchat. Just find a local five-year-old. Well, Snapchat, well, Snapchat, well, Snapchat, well, Snapchat is Van R. Johnson the second. That's the other one. Uh-oh. About to find him. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I got the little ghost thing and the pictures. <laughs> Look, since he doesn't know how to use you know, his first snap is going to be right here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, give everybody one thing you want everyone to take from our conversation this evening. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you all for, for what you do. Um, information is power. It's more important than money. People think it's money, but no. I mean, those who know, know, and they know, find out what to do with it. So thank you for what you do. I know it's unpaid, but it's a very <laughs> vital public service. Thank you for inviting me and having me on. Um, what I want people to know and realize is that that is a great place to live. We're not perfect, but I think we're a great place. And that is pregnant with possibilities. I like to see port. Um, I like the 9 dues, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's a city of first. Uh, it's a city of, of things that are happening, um, but we can make more things happen. Uh, it's a city of great people and great food. Um, again, we need more great people, and we can always use more great food. Um, and we need great ideas, and we need people who are engaged, and we need young people to be involved, not sit on the sidelines. Tell us how we can make your city better. And, and you know, and certainly, um, if I run for something next year, my seat or something different, I want I want folks to vote for me. I think that um, you know it's a hard life being out there, putting your life out there for people to just criticize you all the time. But I mean, I do it. I, I love it. Um, I think I've done it well. Um, I haven't sold out, and, and, and you know, and I'm going to speak the truth. I'm going to speak my mind, and I think that's what people send me to do is to keep it 100 all the time. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, again, I'd love to be able to come back whenever you uh, see fit. And, um, you know, great way for me to end my Friday night. I'm going to give me a nap. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming through. That was Alderman Van Johnson, everyone. Yay. Woo, claps oh. and all that stuff. Yay. <laughs> 
You're listening to WRULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. Real Talk is out. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>